Absolutely. Well, it is about uh, 6.45 and I'll make some brief introductions as more people come into the room uh, for this evening's event. Uh, good evening for those of you who are already with us. My name is Aaron Ott and I'm the Curator of Public Art at the Albright Knox and um, I'm the curator of Swoon's current exhibition at our Northland location uh, called Seven Contemplations, which is uh, on view through January 10th. Uh, so for those of you who can uh, come to the uh, Northland location, uh, cross your fingers, we're still in orange, get your tickets, um, time tickets, uh, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So we'd love to see you there uh, while we still can. So I am uh, delighted to welcome everybody who's here with us this evening uh, for an interesting and, and kind of what I hope is a timely discussion. Um, there's literally hundreds joining us tonight, so that's kind of amazing. And it speaks to, I think, our collective desire to heal uh, ourselves, to heal those around us, um, and to do the work that it takes to support bringing frameworks uh, of healing justice more soundly into current mental health uh, uh, models. So some of you may know Prentice Hemphill is a movement facilitator, a somatics teacher and practitioner and works at the convergence of healing, collective transformation, and political organizing. Uh, and so for well over a decade, Prentice has been a pioneering and visionary leader, facilitating and consulting for organizations and groups, uh, looking to center healing justice and transformative justice into the very core of their work to build more well and self-determined communities. So listing their superlatives and achievements would take a while, and you're here tonight not to listen to me pour over the well-deserved praise for Prentice, but it should be noticed, I think, um, the, the numerous uh, powerful and influential organizations that Prentice works with, such as um, their position as the Healing Justice Director at Black Lives Matter Global Network. Uh, also in 2016, Prentice was awarded the Buddhist Peace Fellowship SOMA Award for community work inspired by Buddhist thought. Uh, they have served as a board member for the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network, and at present, uh, uh, present, Prentice is the founder and leader of Black Embodiment Initiative and uh, the host of Finding Our Way podcast. Uh, and I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled and, and honored uh, to be welcoming uh, Prentice this evening to this conversation. Uh, tonight, Prentice will be speaking with Caledonia Curry, also known as Swoon uh, and Callie, as I will refer to her. Um, and since achieving claim in the early 2000s uh, for her deeply em empathetic uh, portraits, often illicitly wheat pasted uh, to buildings around New York City, Callie has expanded uh, her creative practice to sculptures, collages, paintings, installations for museums, gallery spaces, um, as well as participatory social projects, including um, developing earthquake resistant structures, um, earth bag buildings uh, in Haiti through uh, convict shelter and the heliotrope. Foundation. So connecting all these endeavors for Cali uh, is a deep sort of commitment to a spirit of generosity, sort of embracing art making and sharing as a process of personal and communal healing. Uh, I couldn't begin to articulate Cali's story, which is why she's our speaker tonight with Prentice, but her own healing journey has been personally really inspiring to me, and I know uh, that it's inspired countless others. Um, Cali is an absolute master at creating works that are sort of at once approachable and unconventional, straightforward and complex. Um, her work seeks to establish connectivity between uh, herself and others, others in their own communities, um, all while show showing the capacity that um, art has to encourage healing. Um, I'd like to mention that this evening has been uh, sponsored by Sarah M. Fallon and uh, John R. Fudima, and we truly appreciate their generosity in providing such a wonderful and thoughtful program uh, here at the Albright. Um, tonight does uh, promise to be a thoroughly interesting conversation, so without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to yield the floor to Kelly Curry and Prentice Hemphill. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. That was lovely. Thank you. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Prentice. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here tonight. Me too. Thank you so much for the invitation. It, it feels just like personally timely for me, but just exciting too, to be able to have this kind of conversation in this space. It feels intimate and also really collective too. So thank you. Nice. Your vision. Absolutely. Well, I will say um, just to sort of introduce how we 
how we came to be having this conversation um, that, you know, the, the show um, that we're sort of gathered around, which is maybe like the campfire that we're gathered around um, is an exhibition that brings sort of the last decade of my work into, um, into the Albright Knox. Um, and during the process of it, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a whole sort of a personal journey that has gone into it. And it's something that Aaron and I connected on a lot and that, and that it seems like uh, people who are seeing the show are really able to receive. And so as we started to talk about, you know, what kind of conversation would really fit um, in this moment, I, you know, I kind of just felt like, well, let's see um, what's like the conversation that I would just dream to have. Like, what's the campfire that I would really dream to be around? And I had, um, Prentice, I had known of your work for a long time, but then there was, you know, as sometimes happens with people, there's this moment where somebody would post a quote and I'd be like, I'm sorry, what? And, you know, and then I'd say, who is that? Oh, okay. You know, you start connecting the dots. And, um, and so sort of slowly, uh, I, I, I finally came to the, the, the feeling of like, I would, it would, it would be such a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to have this conversation with you. So I reached out and you said, yes, and here we are. I love that. And I so wish, I mean, this is beautiful that we can connect this way. I'm like, what if we could do it in the museum? That yeah. would be so awesome. lovely. Um, just inside of your, your work, which I can only sense from afar and similarly it's like there's overlap we have in people and then you see images and you're like oh the texture there the like immersiveness of that work and you start connecting the dots you're like oh hi you <laughs> <laughs> so um thank you for your vision there and for being able to see the ways that our work um is intertwined and connective so appreciate mm -hmm. it for that and maybe I'll just say uh, out loud. So we decided to, um, there's a couple questions to just kind of frame our uh, our conversation around tonight. And the first is um, that we each wanna talk about how we found ourselves um, focusing on healing trauma. Um, we also wanna talk about what role creativity has played in that process. And then also what role we think that healing has in our collective liberation. And so um, maybe we could start by, by me asking you the first question, which is how did you find yourself focusing on healing trauma? I was gonna ask you the first question. <laughs> oh, either way, either way. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to ask you first, is that okay? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think I want to ask it like, um, maybe like a two part question, like how did you find yourself focusing on healing trauma and also, when did you know that you were focusing on healing trauma in your work? Because mm. it might be distinct, I'm not yeah. sure. Yes, yes. Um, okay, well, for me, it sort of starts with a part of my life where I was becoming somebody that I didn't want to be. Um, I was having rage attacks. I was being really an angry person and uh, sometimes a kind of a violent person, particularly in my love relationships. And I could not be that person. I just, I, I hated myself. I didn't feel in control of myself. I tried over and over again to change my behavior. I couldn't change my behavior on my own. And I just came to that moment where I was like, I'm not doing this by myself. This isn't happening. I need help. And so I started to reach out for help I started to get help um, and, you know, I think it's that thing that happens where the help was helping me. I was, I was growing, I was opening, I was crying, I was letting things go. And, it, you know, it took a while for me to really, uh, really change my behaviors. But, you know, after almost a year, I started to really make some real and lasting changes and then two years. And, and at that point, I think, as often happens, it's like you've got a gift and you're like, well, well, fuck, I can't hold this, <laughs> you know? And so also because I'm an artist, whatever I'm doing, it's gonna come out in my work. And so, and so as I focused on my own healing, then I started to put my own healing into my, into my work. And then I started to be like, oh my God, like I am not the only one who needs this. I am not the only one. <laughs> having this experience right now let me share um and so I started to I started to share and then 
And then when I first, the first time I knew that I was focusing, one thing that, that um, we chatted a little bit about yesterday is um, I had an experience whereby um, on the day that my mother passed away, I met somebody who said, uh, uh, two people, this couple, um, they're called the Million Person Project. And they said, our work in the world is to help people share their personal stories in the context of their work, because we think that that's how we build trust amongst one another. We understand, you know, when, when you're building movements, when you're building a community, if you, if you come with the story of who you are, you're bringing a lot. And so I said, I'm going to, I'm just going to let this mean something. The fact that I met you on the day that my mom passed away. And I just grabbed one of them and I was like, I need to work with you guys. And, and from there I started to give talks. And that was when I really had to step up and say like, this isn't just something that's hidden secretly within my work. This is something I'm going to say publicly. That's so powerful. And you, you told me that story yesterday and it, it has been like ringing in me mm. since, you know, and that the moment where you're like, I decided that this was going to mean this, yeah. I was like, exactly. You made that meaning and it's, it feels like it has, it is touching so many people as having this conversation right now. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. My turn. You want me to go? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, when, when did I start focusing on healing trauma? I mean, I think it's like a similar thing. It's not a, it's not a kind of linear kind of story. I mean, I think the first, the place where my story begins is that I experienced it. Mm -hmm. I experienced trauma. Um, though I didn't know, I didn't have those words, you know, I don't think we have those words when we're going through those moments. Um, but I experienced trauma over a kind of prolonged period of growing up. Childhood was full of many traumatic kind of punctuations or moments. Um, so I think it, it created, even if I didn't have the understanding, it, there was a, a kind of knowledge at, or kind of knowing I got around how a person can be unraveled. You know, even if you don't know that you're like gaining that kind of knowledge or wisdom, I, I knew that I something could be undone in a person or someone could uh, lose the capacity to imagine themselves in the future. Someone could, um, yeah. So I think having those experiences um, has shaped my work in my life. And I think that I, um, you know, in a way we're always making meaning of our lives, even though my work has expanded beyond me, obviously, and I'm not just working out my stuff. I still am making meaning of that. I mean, that still is a part of how I do, what I do, how I go about it. Um, so I think, yeah, I think experiencing it was one. And then kind of getting politicized, I guess, around my experience. Um, understanding the experience of my family. So there's like the, the trauma that I experienced and then there's the trauma that created those experiences and the trauma that created those experiences. And you start to see yourself in a context where um, there are conditions and situations that keep creating and replicating this thing. So when I started getting politicized uh, it helped me understand. Now, I think there's a way that the way that I entered the political realm it, at the time, I think things are changing, but at the time it was kind of like, there's feelings and stuff over here. Right. And then there's like the polit, there's like work over here. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like se there was so separate. Um, but similarly, I, I felt myself I felt the sights of my ruptures in relationships. I could feel the limits of what I could and could not do in my political work, in my relationships. And I, I think part of it was just me and kind of the nature of me. And part of it was people who were abolitionists that were thinking about transformative justice or thinking about different ways for us to be together that kept leading me down that path of like, Oh, this means something. How we are with each other means something for 
the world that we're trying to create. So um, I think all of that at once just kind of like condensed and exploded into like, oh, your work is around healing trauma and to understand the political context we're in through that lens and to understand the understand trauma as an event that's also related to oppression and history and all of these things and um, articulating that so that we all can feel it a little bit more and resist compartmentalizing ourselves in these ways that don't allow us to have a cohesive experience of being alive. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and when you started to, to focus in on the body to say like, and we, and we need to bring the body into yeah. this, how did that start for you? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I went back and found a blog. I'm not going to tell anybody where it is because it's still <laughs> on the internet and I got to get it down somehow, but a blog from like, <laughs> it's like a blog spot, you know what I mean? From 2008. And I'm talking about um, embodiment and alienation and these, I was like, where did you even get these ideas? I um, but I knew that there was something, uh, there was something to that, that, that you couldn't just think your way through this. I've always had a very tactile experience of life. Like I, I feel, I dance, I express through my body. I, I, I have always danced through my emotions. Mm. I've always been able to process them through dance. Um, and sometime, I, at some point I started to take that seriously as a right. way of being in the world. And then I, I found generative somatics in 2010 mm -hmm. and uh, started, that brought a lot of the pieces together for me. I was like, oh, the body, right. It's not an abstract concept. It's not an object that we just inhabit. It's like where life happens, how you experience and relate to all life and existence got it it's not it means something and if we're going to change we have to change viscerally and not only intellectually you know yeah. um so that that has that clarified for me the approach to healing trauma when i kind of encountered encountered that work can i ask you uh, a follow-up question oh yeah go ahead um i think it's about like well uh, we might actually get to this, so I don't want to skip around too much. Maybe it's kind of the next one. Um, is it okay I'm going off script, Kelly? Yeah, okay. however, no, I mean, that's just there so we don't forget. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, when did you realize the, the power of the pieces you create? I mean, you started to talk about how it could impact people, but when did you really start to understand the power of the work that you create to really shift other people's experiences of their own lives. Yeah. Well, it actually, so the thing you said when you, when you talked about dancing and then you talked about taking it seriously yeah. and I was like, yes, like it's so interesting how, you know, we do these things and we're like, Oh, but I'm just doing this thing like that. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, like there's this wisdom that's emerging right. and like, sort of validating yourself has been part of my um part of my process and so you know i think like from pretty early on i found that people you know because i would put work out on the street and mm -hmm. so you you had no idea who was going to find it and you had no idea what meaning they were going to make from it and so very early on i found that that any work of art could truly become a vessel for almost anything that anyone needed. And that mm -hmm. if they found it, they could, they could make of it what they needed. And, and I would hear stories pretty often where people would say, I had a conversation with your piece. I, you know, I, I, I helped, it helped me make a decision. I, you know, I, me and my dad bonded all these different things that I was like, wow, <laughs> like, I did, I just made a thing. I don't know. And, um, and so, and so I kind of got that sense that like you, you make something and then people, people 
people make of it what they need to make of it. And that's, that's always been really wonderful. Um, but then, you know, I, I started to, um, things got very real for me the time I stood up on, on the stage at this talk called The Feast and, and I gave the talk that my friends helped me to give. And, and I, that was a moment that I had never, um, I've, I've never been that nervous in, in doing anything, you know, not even breaking down on a barge and in, in front of a bar, oncoming barge. I was more nervous to give this talk. I was almost throw up, like, it was so intense um, and somehow, somehow it happened. Um, and then, and then afterward people started to say, um, you know, I felt like I was going to relapse today and I happened upon your talk or mm -hmm. I, you know, just different things people would say. And, and then the kind of a, a really big moment happened with a piece that's at the Albright Knox and, um, it was a piece that I, I started with an image from like a childhood kind of vision that I had. And then I, I made that into material by, by making this switchboard and plugging in these different stories. And I, you know, I felt I was working fairly abstractly and in my head. And yet somehow it felt as though, you know, there's this mental process whereby, you know, you talked about not being able to see yourself in the, in the future. Um, and, and, and there's all these different things that happen, I think, when we go through trauma. And the one that happened for me was that I um, sort of went into a few different pieces to hide the things that I didn't want to see or yeah. think or feel. Mm -hmm. I was like, those are, that's not a thing. That's out here and it's hidden and it's broken off, you know, but then you don't have those parts of yourself. You don't have access to them. And um, through all the different kinds of therapy, but somehow I was aware of it while I was making this piece. I, I made the switchboard and I brought in these stories and he's learning these different things. And as I was doing it, I was like, I believe myself. Yeah. That's it. Like no one else is confirming this for me. No one else. I, I'm the one who experienced this. I experienced it alone and I'm, and I believe myself. Yeah. And that was so powerful. Yeah. Um, and then a woman sent me a note and she was like, I, I didn't understand how to conceptualize or articulate this experience that I had. And then I experienced your piece and now I get it. And I was like, bah! <laughs> you know, and that was, that was a moment for yeah. sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's amazing. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what the next question is. <laughs> I just think anything that pops to your mind. <laughs> Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm kind of thinking because, you know, I think the, the question that we had was around how creativity has been involved in your healing process. And I think you're kind of um, speaking to that and um, also the different creative ways that we can heal storytelling all of that too, you know, it's, there are so many different modalities and there's so much creativity inside of healing. Um, I guess my question, maybe I'll, I'll shift around and come back, but when you think about kind of on the broader level, when you think about collective healing, like what's the role that you think um, creativity can play in that? Or, well, I guess first, like, what do you think about collective feeling? Does that feel, mm. do you relate to that effort? And then how do you think about creativity in relationship to that? Mm. That question is like, it feels like the this big question that just to hear it asked, I'm like, oh yes, like yeah. ask that. I, I don't, I don't know, I mean, I do believe deeply in the potential for, for collective healing. And I believe that as much as we feel our lives in chaos and as many of the ways that they're alienating and, and violent things are happening in our world, I also keep an eye on the level of change that has happened and it, it really fuels this belief that we are doing something together and that our ancestors 
did something together and that we are part of their work and and that question of yeah what what next what do we do how do we how do we share and learn and grow and evolve yeah yeah i mean i think you've had a lot of experiences of 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 that process in action right yeah yeah i mean when i think about uh collective healing even creation liberation these words all have a a thread to me they're so yeah. related to one another you know the the origin the source the generativity the kind of what we were talking about earlier creating new worlds um that all of that has a shared root in a way or a shared a shared origin mm -hmm. um so yeah i think i've seen it very much in action through organizing through being a part of so many uprisings and being able to see or feel what's inside of what people are generating what people are trying to move um and there's so much you know we, we bring all of our rawness and our beauty to those moments and it's um there's also just like so palpably i feel like um a longing for space for our our stories and our experiences to be real to be validated to be cared about to have our our lives and our stories change reality change the course of you know what's happening because I, I feel like so much about trauma and about trauma on a collective level too trauma on the individual and trauma on collective level I always talk about it as kind of an interruption in time it, that that's what it feels like to me that part of us part of our bodies our embodiment gets um uh I don't want to just say stuck but yeah, gets halted, gets caught in a moment mm -hmm. in time. And it is either avoiding that moment perpetually or recreating that moment perpetually. But parts of ourselves get caught in those moments. And what makes it so um, painful, it makes it so hard to move through is that we also don't have a culture that um and i'm speaking real broadly you know we all have different flavors of culture but as a whole we don't have a, a culture that invites the the processing of trauma that we deny that level of pain we deny that level of um violence we deny it and um it makes it harder for us to to process those things that we hold and i think it's i think it's almost like uh a kind of imperative or denial is almost a a, a cultural value that keeps any of us from making sense <laughs> fully keeps any of us from being truly accountable, keeps us from caring to the depths that we could about what we've experienced, what others around us have experienced. There's so much denial and it's so valued. The suppression, oppression, denial, and the forward motion yeah. um, that I think in those moments where we resist that in whatever ways that we do, you know, I think our, our creativity, our whatever it is that we generate outside of that paradigm is resisting that. The moments where we come together collectively to resist that, to say, no, 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 no. This, this grief that I experience in this moment, this grief, all these moments of grief that we can collect up together that are more than you can imagine, they actually matter. They actually mean something. They actually tell a story that we can't continue to deny without becoming disintegrated. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I think that 
I definitely feel how it all gets caught up together and why it's so important that we, um, yeah, engage in healing, engage in, healing makes it possible to create in a lot of ways. And healing is also creation. It's also, it's the process and it makes it possible. So um, yeah, I think we just need more and more, more than we can even imagine. It needs <laughs> to be at the center of everything we do, you know? <laughs> yeah. What, what are your thoughts there? I feel like I just went off on a I'm having that problem where I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> I just want to hear you talk. I'm like, this is fun. <laughs> um, no, I hear you so much on that. And I, you know, I feel it at so many levels. I feel it at, you know, the level of my family, the family that I grew up in was, you know, my grandmother's generation was all about denying suffering and allowing perpetrators to continue committing violence because yeah. they deny that suffering. You know, and another thing I've been thinking a lot about is that um, I'm a white person with ancestry going back so many generations in the South. Um, and I and I'm just sort of waking up and realizing that, you know, my my ancestors, many perpetrator ancestors, that there's there was never any never any dialogue passed down about, well, what did your ancestors do and how can you make reconciliation? Can you how can you create uh, reparations or or create moments of um you know, healing, there was just nothing. And, and so that's another question that I'm starting to ask is like, well, yeah, like you said, this denial, why was there nothing? Um, mm -hmm. And, and thinking about the, the, the fear and the shame and all the things mm -hmm. that yeah. sort of hold that silence in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, starting to ask those questions at a familial level, but also at a cultural level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are rituals of acknowledgement? What are, what are, uh, you know, uh, concrete actions of, of reparation? What are, are things that, that can be done to, to create healing kind of culturally together? That's right. That's right. I just, um, I got caught on one thing that you said. So I wonder if I can ask you a question about that. Just, um, I've been thinking a lot about shame too. And, there's just a lot there, but I'm wondering like, when we're thinking about one, what is the relationship between shame and the creative process mm -hmm. for you? And then I think there's another question. Well, we can, I think there's a shame that we often feel that doesn't allow us to start to embark on a process of healing and transformation, whatever that ends up meaning for us. And I think in general, I'm just curious, like what are the ways that you have um, moved through that? And probably in some ways addressing the inherited shame from your ancestors, how have you moved through that, broken that up so that you can express, you know? Just yeah. what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think that when my shame was unconscious, it's, um, it meant that I created in my store, the stories were always in my work, but it was sort of secretive. Um, and I created more from a place of just kind of wanting to be like seen or wanting to be fun or wanting to be cool or wanting to be these things, right? You know, you're young and you're just like, um, and then once I started to get into it, get into it, um, I learned this thing about shame, which is that it's, it's, there's so much energy under it. Yeah. And now I feel like when I feel shame, I'm like, Oh, what's up? Like, let's mm -hmm. talk. And sometimes it takes a while. Um, sometimes I have to sit with a shame feeling for a couple of years, think about it, you know, walk around it. But now I, I feel like I, 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 I almost feel like it's like a little, like I'm like, there's all this energy under there mm -hmm. and it feels like it's gonna explode and it feels like it's nasty energy and, and something's gonna get fucked up and everyone's gonna be mad at you. But I, I'm starting to gain this real trust in moving towards shame of just being like, no, the healing is under that. Like, let's go, let's look there. That's right, 
That's right. Hmm. That's powerful. Do you feel like that, just to keep connecting it, like how does it show up in the work that you've been able to do in the last few years? I mean, the concretely, uh, you know, the, the work that's at Albright Knox, there's a piece called the Medea that's all around addressing deep shame around um, the intergenerational effects of sexual violence and mental illness and, um, and the culture, I feel like, it's hard to describe why I felt I was like, everyone's going to think that like, it's hard to describe what you even think when you're under the shame. You're like, I'm going to be, you know, the, the shame story doesn't really make that much sense. It's like, oh, they're going to, you're just going to feel, you're going to be, you're going to be pushed out somehow. No one's going to want to hear you. You know, all of these things that are sometimes true in our culture, like when the sort of perpetrator mind state has its clamp on the culture, certain mm -hmm. kind of stories do get knocked down and, and get knocked back. And I think the reason that I'm in a place where I'm able to, to start sharing and where, you know, a, a place like the Albright Knox is able to say, tell it, tell it, is because we're, we're shifting, things are shifting and, and, and there's an opening that's happening. Um, and, and so, and so that, you know, that piece has started to come out and, and, you know, then the, the sort of new piece for me is asking this question about um, just about my ancestral legacy in terms of being being perpetrators of violence and domination and colonialism and, and all of that and opening up, Try, just just starting to ask the question of like, well, what 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 do we do? How do we address that? Mm. And that hasn't hasn't become anything, but that's just where I'm at. I'm just that's my I'm like I'm at the what I'm at yeah. the how. Yeah. How about? Oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I just feel, I, I I I think in that moment of feeling like I'm talking a lot, I had the had the the <laughs> moment of wanting to be like, hey, can we talk about your book that you're writing? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, we could talk about it. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to how to do this. You know, it. We had a conversation. We've had a couple conversations before this, and. Um, thinking about creativity in relationship to my work. And I remember I was thinking about before I got on here, how a teacher of mine years ago said, uh, you should teach the way you dance. Mm. And cause I was so kind of like trying to get it right when I first started teaching, okay, what are all the points that I have to say? And even when it works with clients, you know, I, I'm trained as a somatic practitioner. I'm also trained as a therapist. So I remember the first day I went into a session with a client, the first session, they don't know you've never done therapy before. So I'm like closing the door and I'm oh shit, <laughs> like what am I about to do? Um, and so the, the effort to try to get it right um, would sometimes overwhelm what is my gift that is inherent to me and my ability to dance as I, as I work. And now as a practitioner, as a body worker, it feels much less about me in a way. Like, am I gonna get this right? And it's like, how well can you move that part of you out of the way to let what is bigger or more authentic run through you and make connection and not overpower it or hover over the connection, but be more as a active witness to what's possible when people connect, what can dislodge in someone, what can dislodge in you even when um, you're able to be vulnerable or invite vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, I've been trying to dance more in my work, in my writing, and uh, in my practitionership. So I'm writing a thing. It is uh, scary mm. to do because it uh, it's like, it's, it's, you know, I was writing for a while and I shared it with somebody who was a friend of mine. And she was like, 
this is great, but where are you <laughs> in it? Where, where are you? And I think when you and I first talked, you said, do you tell your story? And that like stuck with me. You said that you were like, okay, where do you tell your story? And I was like, oh, right. Yeah. I, I, that's still an edge for me, kind of the shaping I had growing up. So this is what I'm writing is trying to blend. Basically it's trying to, I'm trying to show my work. I'm trying to show how I move from point A to point, whatever point this is. Mm -hmm. um, and how do I create, um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like what we talked about earlier. It's like believing myself and saying, this is what I think is true about healing. Um, and I know it because I felt it. I know it because it's changed me. Mm -hmm. And I know what's possible for changing everything else around us if we follow that energy if we let ourselves come undone in these places and imagine something more and invite more vulnerability and more connection, if we go to those places that you talked about where shame is, is like covering so many capacities that we have, if we go to those places and sit with them, what will be uncovered and unlocked? So I'm trying to tell that story. I'm trying to make um, the connection between our personal healing and our collective transformation, the, the connection between what it means for me to heal and what it means for us to heal and how it, it changes um, reality, how, how there's not much of a difference. There's not much of a gap between um, healing and justice. Mm. Wow. It's a very thin line. So I'm, I'm trying to make that case to my writing through my story and it is, it is turning me inside out. So mm -hmm. nothing but respect to artists. I'm, <laughs> I'm a baby artist trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. Are we supposed to do Q and A now? That's what I was just wondering. Yeah, oh. I think it's probably that time. We we absolutely can. I didn't want to break in because, like I said, this is uh, this has been insightful. And I, I can say, you know, just watching some of the the chat feed that, and I was writing notes too. I mean, there's definitely some things that have resonated um, already with the group. Prentice, I, I have to say that you know, denial as a cultural value is something that landed with me immediately, and then I saw it, uh, you know, kind of torched up in the in the chat as well. And, and so I, I think that that's kind of an amazing um, thing to note. Um, I will say that I've got, you know, a couple questions here. Some are more practical, some are a little bit more philosophical, although I do want to ask a very practical question, because I think it's really important and that and, and maybe both of you can can answer this from different perspectives. But there is a person here who says, you know, my family's having a tough time finding a therapist and, you know, uh, we understand that finding the right person is so important. So do you have any advice what finally worked for you? You know, I, I certainly know the struggle of, of finding therapists, but I think that sometimes people who are, are maybe even have recognition that they may need help don't necessarily advocate for themselves or, or don't know where to go. So I guess I, I'd leave that with you you know, in terms of practical, practical advice that you might have for people who know they, they and want to take the next step, but are, uh, find themselves maybe stuck. You go first. Um, I can too. Yeah, way. go ahead. Okay. Um, I also have a hard time finding a therapist. I have one, but <laughs> people are always like, how do you find a therapist? I'm like, mm. I struggle too. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's such a, one thing I want to say is that one of the things that Kelly and I talked about before we got here was just like the different modalities that have actually served different parts of our healing. So I've been doing somatic body work, completely transformed my life for 10 years. There are things that I can do now and feel now that I was never able to do. And someone might not be that may not be your level of comfort to do kind of body work as a practice, but it's something that deeply transformed my life. I've also had therapy for years. 
And now even just writing and doing kind of storytelling as Callie was talking about, it's touching parts of my experience that I have never been able to touch through body work. So I, I wanna, I think therapy is so, so critical and, um, and sometimes it's limited what we're able to find. And there are just so many avenues to um, healing too that I wanna invite people to do. And then I think the other thing to know about finding a therapist and probably people have heard this all the time, but there's a, depending on your journey, the part of, of finding a therapist, of, of building trust with someone is also a part of the process of restoring a sense of agency. Mm -hmm. And so being able to work with someone and be like, you know what, this isn't working for me. I've had to do that twice and it is not fun, but did I feel like I was able to express a boundary and feel the impact, the somatic impact of expressing a boundary by doing that process? Absolutely. So there are a lot of amazing practitioners out there and also see the whole process of, the process is beginning as soon as you are longing to address it. And so you are engaged in that healing process throughout all of that. So um, as much as you can know that, get support from folks around you. I've had people help me go through the process of finding a therapist and um, that has really helped me too. So practically that's what I would offer. Mm. I just heard something I need in that. <laughs> um, I think that my own experience has been, you know, when when Prentice and I were talking about um, the experience of writing, you were talking about how writing meant a different thing for you. I had this image in my head of like this very faceted crystal and feeling like healing is that. And, um, and so I started by reading. Reading was not gonna ever be the full journey for me, but it accompanied my entire process. And, um, and so I guess I would say that the, the, the most powerful thing I think that you bring to the search for a therapist is the willingness to heal. And that that is, it's, it's like a little generator of its own and, and, and that can, can unfold in a lot of different um, circumstances. And then, um, you know, and then I have also worked with, a, with a, a quite a few different therapists from talk therapy to um, working with psychedelics to working uh, with, with the body um, and, and combinations therein, um, the creation of artwork, reading, um, you know, even giving public talks, you know, all of it, I consider all of it a piece of the puzzle. And so I, I think that um, this isn't really a practical answer, but I would just say to like, to, to remember that there are all these facets of it and they're all valuable. And to remember that the, the key piece is, is the willingness to, um, to make change. Yeah, I think that's really, really beautiful and, and powerful. And, and I think that willingness to, to make change might lead us to, you know, one of the next questions, which, because, you know, again, Prentice, you know, you said, um, I think you said something like, you know, we have to have that change viscerally, not just intellectually, right? And so one of the questions that came up was, you know, how do we foster, because your work, Prentice, deals a lot with, with, well, it converges, but it deals with politics. So um you know one of the questions is how do we foster a political landscape that privileges healing and caring that's a complex question because i think it's a multi-pronged strategy that helps us do that um but i guess it begins with kind of what are the values of your political engagement and understanding that we are all you know, I resisted it for a long time to see myself as kind of a political being. I'm like, I want to be free. I don't want to be a political being, but it's a way of understanding yourself in relationship to um, power and de self-determination and governance that there's an aspect of you that is politically um, engaged. So how do we be more accountable to um, that? So for me, it's first starts with understanding yourself politically. 
who are you? How do you map the kind of power that you have, how you're related to the world? What, where are you situated geographically? Um, what institutions do you belong to? And you have accountability at each of those sites to engage and to increase engagement. Um, the political world is partly the, it, it's what it means to make meaning of the world. That's where meaning gets made. That's where reality gets, a lot of our reality gets constructed, where resources get um, distributed. So how are you accountable to the ways in which the places where you are embedded are engaging with those questions? And that's really important. You know, as a therapist, people were like, Oh, therapists are not political. Absolutely. How, what's the clinic I'm working at doing? How is it engaging with uh, the broader community? How are we understanding the impacts of oppression? Are we only individualizing the challenges that people have? How are we imagining that we can, th this is the, the kind of end all be all of healing with, I think there's something very healing about engaging with the making of the world, with engaging politically that heals something about my ability to belong to a whole and to take action that affects the collective. It's not only about the kind of individual healing. So I think that that um, is a really important piece for me. Um, and I think that's part of a larger strategy. I think our, the values that we hold around transformative justice, around um, decreasing harm and violence and increasing our capacity to address harm and violence in our communities and having that standard um, be a standard that is held by the institutions that we are invested in. How are these institutions that we invest in decreasing violence universally for everybody here and increasing capacity to react and respond with compassion and care and, um, and, and repair? So um, I think it's important for us to, to, there's a lot more I could say, but to map along that way and, and, and um, push ourselves to engage as much as possible. So good. To, to think about that, I, I sort of, at first I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't have any answers to that question. But I just want to tell one story um, that I read. It's, it's just a, a thing that really stuck with me, um, which is that the study of trauma itself, um, the study of PTSD itself, um, was actually suppressed for almost a hundred years um, because the political landscape wouldn't allow people to say, uh, I'm hurting. And it was because the power was in favor of the people who were doing the harm. And so, and in that case, it was, it was people, the powerful politicians that would send people off to war and, 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 and they would end up with PTSD. And then the soldiers would come back and the power structure would say, that's your fault. Um, or, you know, also the kind of patriarchal culture was saying, like, if, if, if children are being harmed in the home, if less powerful people are being harmed, um, you know, the white supremacist patriarchal culture was saying, like, all oh, that's your fault. Um, the harm that you received is somehow your fault. And, and it wasn't until um, the anti-Vietnam War political movement and feminism started to create these circles and this kind of pushback against the against the the notion that it was okay to just send people off in war or it was okay to subjugate uh, women and children, then suddenly there became a space for people to recognize PTSD. And so I think um, the link, you know, that it just one of those stories that just really illustrated me this profound link between sort of the political and the kind of how we're able to even understand our own healing. Yeah, that's beautiful just say and powerful. how important yeah. that is. Like that that piece that you just shared is so so critical for us to understand that trauma, our understanding of trauma has always been political. Yeah. Who is traumatized, whose pain matters, whose pain is quieted is always a political question, meaning it is always a question of power. Mm -hmm. And so how do we engage that? question in a way that allows us to listen more, see more, recognize the humanity and pain of other people and ourselves. We disappear our own selves in shame because we are told that those places, you know, those identities, those people that we are, are not um, allowed to feel pain and it's not allowed 
for that pain to matter. So sorry, I just got excited when you were talking about that. Yes. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. And I think, you know, again, a lot of people here have talked about, you know, whether it's, it's shame, uh, hurt, rage um, that they are dealing with. You know, I think, you know, Prentice, you pointed out, you know, each of us kind of finds our own way. But, um, you know, among the questions here is, you know, each of you are creative in your, in your own ways. And in, you know, you're, you're dealing with your own individualized traumas. We deal with them collectively as well. But how are you keeping focus? How are you staying creative? How are you keeping hope when confronted with those, you know, you're dealing, you are, you're both dealing with challenging issues so how do you how do you maintain because Callie there's so much generosity in your work Prentice there's so so much caring and and um and uh insight in what you offer I just you know how, how does it not overwhelm you because I feel like it overwhelms a lot of people I would say that sometimes it does overwhelm me um that's for sure and that the the fortunate thing for me and i imagine this may be true for you as well prentice is that the the work gives strength that it's because you know i started drawing because it was meditative i could go there i could I could, you know, generate this atmosphere within which I could live and survive as a human. Um, and so it meant that there was always this resourcing that was coming at me from my practice. And so when I bring this really tough stuff into the practice, it's giving, it's generating, it's, it's like bringing it to the well. And so there's a kind of a strength that comes from it. Yeah, I really resonate with that answer. Both parts that I do get overwhelmed. At times I have been overwhelmed for stretches, um, but there is something for me about when we are real with one another, it just gives me like a, a rush of life to make authentic connection, to be myself with other people, to have other people be themselves with me, for us to change with one another and heal. Um, and then when things, when I write or when things start to make a sense, it's like a fog lifts. I mm -hmm. feel so connected ancestrally. I feel like somebody left a clue for me. <laughs> and I'm like, how oh, the world makes so much more sense. Existence makes more sense. And I just feel so grateful. So yeah, it does something to me. Amazing. That, that's, a, that's a hopeful uh, way to leave this. I, I, I can't thank you both enough for um, participating this evening, for, for giving insight um, to what we're doing right now, but also, uh, again, in, in your practices and continuing that um, individually and collectively. It's, it's something that has made um, a great deal of impact on, on me, on our institution, on people who are, um, who are involving themselves in the work that, that both of you do. So I wanna say thank you. And as someone wrote in the chat, which I knew, uh, happy birthday, Callie. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, was birthday. it was yesterday, but this is the best birthday present for me. This is the, <laughs> I'm like, just la. Happy birthday. Oh, we're badges. We're both yeah. sad. <laughs> <laughs> it was last week. That's right. Oh, I saw your post about dancing naked. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. That's so exciting. <laughs> Well, this was the perfect birthday present for me. Thank you. Thank you both. I love you. And, 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 and thank you so much to the participants who joined us this evening. And uh, I hope everybody uh, goes forth and puts more love into the world. Oh, yeah. Thanks, wow. y'all. Thank you, Callie. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Prentice. Thank, thank you, so thank much. everyone. Good night.